So, could you give me your name and your role, please? Hi, I'm Professor Derek Stewart, and I'm Director of the Advanced Plant Growth Centre, which is hosted at the James Sutton Institute. That's great, thanks. And vertical farming's been around for a relatively short period, but you think now that the renewable energy makes it a game changer? It has. Well, I say, I'll correct you one bit. The, the argument for vertical farming or controlled environment farming goes back to um, the times of the Caesar in Rome. Apparently one of them was ill and wanted cucumbers off season, so they started glass house production. But yeah, I think vertical farming per se, as we know it now, and I've seen it in the papers, probably the last five years has come into evidence. Um, it's predicated on using energy for the light. So if you can cure the problem of how you access your energy cheaply, you'll win, because productivity-wise, it wins hands down. And a, a lot of people are, are view vertical farming, its potential as, as being more suited to industrial estates. Why is it a game changer? or Why is it now more attractive to the agriculture sector? Um, it goes back to what farmers want to do. You know, I've yet to see a farmer who doesn't feel that his job is to grow things, whether it's crops or animals, for the, the customer. Um, so I think putting vertical farm back into the hands of the farmer makes sense. They, they, they have the care embedded within them and they're generally astute businessmen so they'll know how it works. And what it offers then is a portfolio of it was part of their business. Um, the vertical farm will grow 24 7, 365, so climate change doesn't impact upon it. So you will always get a product and that's key as a businessman. How do you think um, climate change is, is, is making it more attractive to farmers? Well, as I say, I think it, it, the vertical farm is climate agnostic. Um, so you will be able to guarantee a product at any point, whether it's three metres of snow or it's, in Scotland it might be unlikely, 30 degrees. Uh, either of those you'll, you'll still produce. And, and actually, you may then use that to target the more higher value crops. You may actually think, it's not actually food I'm going to grow, it may be ornamentals, flowers. The value for flowers is huge. Vertical farms are perfect for that as well. And are you seeing a lot of interest in the agri-sector and wanting uh, to adopt this? Do you see both interest and scepticism, which I think is healthy for any new technology. Uh, I think uh, it has to be socialised amongst, any new technology has to be socialised. And that's, that's my part of my job, I'm doing that. Um, but working with lots of farmers, not just the farmers, but the a whole part of the supply chain. Um, we're starting to see the supply chain wanting to decarbonise its production. This through renew renewable energy use to grow the plant offers that opportunity. But I, I, I see this as I'd like to see it going back to the farmer because it'll bring the value right back into the farmer's hands and not lose it post farm gain. What, um, what level of investment would a farmer need to... Um, it's anything from the thousands to the millions. Um, I wouldn't want to put a number on it just now. It depends on what you want to do. I think you would start smaller to get your to get your eye in. Um, interestingly, we're we're working with, for example, uh, the Islands deal to put a vertical farm up in Orkney, and that the the, view, the plan there is to have a, a community vertical farm. Um, and again, that's going to be in a million. Uh, it's probably going to be a million-ish for that one. But then. If you run it purely commercially, a return on investment in something like that would be two or three years. Okay. Which is spectacularly good. Um, the other route to the investment bit becomes interesting as well is, depending on what you're growing, say you want to grow plantlets for producing outside, well, the vertical farm could be bought and run as a cooperative amongst several farmers to produce plantlets for their farms. And actually, off-season, you'll grow something else. Because the vertical farm itself, you can class it like an Airbnb for plants. You will book in slots of time to grow things within it. So it's never unproductive. Um, and that's why it can uh, generate such a high return. What kind of role could the Scottish Government play, or the UK Government for that matter? In the UK, promoting the Scottish them? Government's interesting because it was part of the SNP manifesto uh, to increase vertical farming, uh, particularly through renewable energy. So I kind of would say we're delivering on that big for them. Um, the UK government, there will be a review from DEFRA coming out on controlled environment agreements, which I have reviewed for them. Um, it's been extremely well written and generally it, it's positive. The problem again is always going to be energy. How do you feel that? But there's multiple different routes to, to get towards that. But um, as we've seen, agriculture is facing some real problems. There's a huge fertiliser factory just shut down down south. Um, uh, 
where we're importing kind of vertical farmish crops from um, is basically on fire in southern Europe at the moment. So our old uh, import nations are having problems. We need to onshore a lot more of that. Uh, I think the government needs to give some sort of support and incentive to developing that sector. There's lots of different ways they can do it. Okay, and in terms of technology development, how much further is this going to go, do you think? I think we've just scratched the surface. Um, so we know, it's, it's kind of empirical, to be brutally honest at the moment. So we know we can play around with the lights, the nutrients, the increase the CO2 levels. Uh, what we need to do now is, how do we, we need to get a handle on blending the environment with the genetics. So the, all the plants we grow in a vertical farm in the minute are the ones that we would have traditionally grown outside. Can we design them better through traditional breeding or any other type of breeding to grow much better optimised crops in a vertical farm? Say for example, can we grow raspberries in a vertical farm? Can we get a dwarf raspberry plant that will, that will continuously fruit? Now that, that offers up huge potential. So your footprint for growing, uh, we might, I'm not saying we would get rid of all the polytunnels, but if you can do it within that system and produce it continually, use that land for something else then, perhaps. Yeah. But again, it's balancing investment, appetite for risk, and how the farmer themselves feel. Yeah. And instead of growing strawberries on platforms on prime agricultural land. you grow them on these elevated snooker tables, one above the other. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a company called Fisher Farms that are already doing that. And quite successfully, it looks. Uh -huh. And do you think the future is in vertical farming? Part of it will be. Uh, this is this is another technology as part of, part of the portfolio. I think as we discussed before we came on there, you've got the the initiatives on things like the hands-free hectare, where it's like the, the driverless tractor. Um, we've now got automatic weeders going out, uh, robo weeders at night. You've got the small robot company who we work with looking at doing weeding. You've got drones delivering precision fertilizer and sprays. The game's changed. I mean, that, the genie for technology is out of the bottle now. Um, the, the struggle, I think, may be that um, it, on farming, it's the wealth of data you're going to have to handle now is becoming difficult. So uh, what we're seeing is actually, and for vertical farms like I've discussed, is running them almost like a dashboard. So you, you don't have to worry about all the data. It's giving you like your car. So basically, you'll have a dashboard like the Tesla and it'll tell you in broader scales how things are going because these things essentially will be automated after a while. The AI and machine learning and data, data systems will learn how to run the plant and grow the plant themselves and will give you updates whenever you want it. Whether you're, I don't know, sitting in Malaga having a pint at San Miguel, you can look on your phone, yep, everything's going fine. It will maybe ping you an alert, which means you will then call someone to go in. But that's not for everything. Um, and of course, the, the other advantage is that it doesn't have to be food. It could be crops for cosmetics industry, pharmaceuticals. That just offers that huge opportunity now. So there's an element of diversification opportunities for a farmer then? Absolutely. The key thing is the farmers are simpatico with the plant. Always have been, and it's in their blood. That That's a key bit that is very difficult to... to you can teach to a degree, but if you're hardwired to that, you'll win on this system. Okay. In terms of um, staffing levels, you, you say in future this is going to be completely automated. So It will be much more automated. So I think what will happen is it, it offers up opportunities in the farming where the, the ability to bring in migrant labour is diminished. So what you'll start to create is a lesser number of jobs, but they'll be permanent and higher value jobs. Now that's, an, that's actually chimes with Scottish and UK policy, big style. But actually, that's an aside. We're thinking more about this. We're thinking more about the sector at the moment, and, and keeping it going and progressing it. Um, and when you when you're advertising for people at the, the higher level of salary, be brutally honest, salary wins, and it's a permanent job. Yeah. Okay. Is it, how how much in demand is the Hutton Institute's expertise in terms of vertical farming? Um, it's keeping me busy 24/7, 365. I'm honest, yeah. It's it's. It's a hugely interesting industry, um, both at the, the business and the research level, it's huge. So we've got PhD students, we've got multiple different projects funded by Scottish government, UK government, um, international fund as well. Um, everyone wants 
everyone wants to be everyone wants to be exposed to it. Um, it'll go through. Go back to that word again: socialising the technology, finding it. We don't know where the boundaries of the technology are yet. How far can you push it? Um, as I said before, we uh, working with the company Intelligent Growth Solutions have had chili plants that have been continually fruiting for eighteen months. That's unheard of. What else can we do with it? Has there been any 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 pushback towards the technology from the traditionalists? Um, I think maybe through a, an aspect of not coming in and learning about it, that there's always a natural recalcitrance to new technology. Um, I would also say on the flip side, the vertical farming has been oversold by some, but then isn't, isn't every technology done like that? So if you want to find out about it, give me a shout, come in, have a look, we'll have a chat, I'll maybe expose you and take you through the technology and just see if it's for you. And it can be a graded level of technology. It doesn't have to be all singing, all dancing from the start. It can be a lower level. So your approach is very pragmatic in terms of this? I'm a pragmatic man, Jim. <laughs> I, like to, I like to see the science going on, but I like to see the science working. Is there anything you, you would particularly like our, our readers to know about this? Um, well, it's part, of the, it's, it's part of the Advanced Plant Growth Centre, so please, please come and have a chat to us. Okay, Grant, I think cool. that's it. Okay. Brilliant, thanks Take very care. much.